The West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, WACBIB, was established in 2014 as one of the World Bank's Africa Centers of Excellence. WACBIB is located on the campus of the University of Ghana, Ligon. WACBIB was established uh, as one of the World Bank African Centers of Excellence. And the inspiration behind it is basically that um, a number of us who were at the Department of Biochemistry and uh, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, um, we had trained outside and we did uh, PhDs in various science disciplines outside the country. Um, when we got back and realized that uh, there was not much by way of facilities uh, to train uh, scientists, uh, we saw this as uh, an opportunity to create an environment uh, which would enable many young scientists to get the opportunity to get the quality of training that we got um, overseas. This world-class research centre started off as an infectious disease centre, but along the line it's added non-communicable diseases to its focus areas. WACBIB is providing something to local and regional students that we probably don't have in many places within the country or within the region. Um, facilities, financial resources, as well as um, an environment that encourages student learning and research. And that has significantly increased students' output in the Department of Biochemistry Cell and Molecular Biology. WACBIB has a whole range of collaborators at the institutional, national, regional, and international levels. These collaborations include the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research Ghana, the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Ghana, among other departments, the Ghana Health Service, and the Ministry of Health. The center also has collaborations with institutions within and outside Africa. Currently, there are about six labs in the center, and these labs do research based on the faculty who is in charge of these labs. We have a malaria group that has three different units. There's an immunology unit, there's a vaccine development unit, and also a transmission unit in there. We also have a molecular biology lab that has two faculty in charge there. One does work with um, animal, African animal trypanosomes. And the other one, who is myself, works in um, Bruliosa and antimicrobial resistance. We have a huge virology group. Um, they do research anything that has to do with viruses. So they do HIV research. They even look at some bat viruses and um, gastroenteric viruses. More recently, too, we've added a COVID lab. And this lab does routine testing for COVID um, um, positivity and negativity. And we also look for seroprevalence across um, the population. So people who have been prior exposed to COVID, but maybe have been asymptomatic, so they don't know whether they had COVID or not. And we, we actually just re um, recently um, published a paper on, on our findings. The Virology Laboratory of WACPIP was set up right from the beginning um, with one main lab, and they were doing things like um, rotaviral, uh, researching into rotaviral infections in Ghana. The virology lab at WACPIP was also involved in the first uh, identification of a dengue case in Ghana and also doing HIV research as well as research on um, viruses which might, which are in bats but which might be, uh, have a risk of causing disease in humans. So these are filoviruses. Uh, the same type of viruses that cause Ebola. So that's work that was being done. The center currently has six research laboratories, namely the Cell Biology and Immunology Lab, commonly known as the Malaria Lab, the Molecular Biology Lab, the Virology Lab, the Medicinal and Natural Products Lab, the Next Generation Sequencing Lab, and the Forensic Biochemistry Lab. At WACBIP, the scientific tools and equipment are always and readily available to students, regardless of the courses being studied at the center. Really, the driving force was to try to create 
um, you know, a world-class research and training environment uh, where young African scientists from across the continent can come here and develop their talent and do high quality research that can be comparable to research that's done in any part of the world. Um, so basically that was the vision that we, we were pursuing. Throughout my academic journey, I'd always looked for opportunities to come back home. My plan has always been to establish myself, to spend my most productive, my most useful years um, in Africa and hopefully in Ghana. So even though I studied abroad um, altogether for 13 years, um, followed by six years as a postdoc also abroad, so altogether I was away from Ghana for about 18 years, um, I was always looking for opportunities to return. So during my second postdoc, I actually met Professor Wandari, the director of WACPIP in London, when he came to actually receive an award. And that was the first time I heard about WACPIP. Um, and so hearing about WACPIP, hearing what Professor Wandari was trying to do in Ghana, um, I felt that it was a place that would, would welcome someone like me, a place that someone like me potentially could thrive. So I began to look for opportunities to, to return. And I was able to get funding to support my return to, to Ghana. And so I applied for a position and was appointed as a research fellow. It was basically a, 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 a fulfillment of something I'd always wanted to do. And WAGBIP stood out as a place that, even though it was a young center, um, was led by somebody who himself was very dynamic, who identified a lot with the ideals that I myself identify with. Um, and so was somebody that I thought I could, I could work for, yeah, uh, somebody I could, I could mentor me. WAGBIP has evolved to become a world-class research center, thriving on initial funding from the World Bank and subsequent support from the Wellcome Trust and the Africa Academy of Science. We were very fortunate to get the funding through World Bank um, to establish the Center of Excellence here. And part of that funding gave us a huge chunk of money to buy core equipment that could be used and shared by all faculty in the department and opened up to faculty um, within the university and within the sub-region. We have a core facility for flow cytometry. We also have a core facility for, for sequencing of DNA. Just recently, we've even upgraded it to include um, a next seek Illumina sequencer, which is probably one of two in, in the entire Africa. And that has the capacity to sequence both DNA and RNA, which is world class. We have a confocal microscope core facility, which um, can be used to take images of cells and for us to understand actual cell biology as it happens um, in real time. We also have the protein expression lab that I talked about, and we have state-of-the-art equipment in these laboratories that help us, again, um, produce, make proteins, express proteins, and take it to the next level of trying to identify what these proteins actually do within cells. Since I've been uh, in the virology department, I've been doing mostly HIV research looking at, that's my uh, specialty, looking at how um, the different genotypes we have in Ghana affect the ability of treatment and the progression of the disease. And of course, since the pandemic, uh, we have been at, right at the forefront of uh, doing research um, of SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID-19 in Ghana. The HIV research uh, that we've done here at Virology, prior to my coming, there's been some findings that uh, in the Ghanaian population, some of the genes that may be involved in uh, progression are deleted in some of the population. Actually, one of uh, a few of my colleagues uh, did that work. And since I've been here, we've been looking at uh, the new drug which has been introduced in Ghana, Dolitagravir, and our data which is yet to be published is showing that it is one of the best drugs to be used. And we are also selecting some mutations for this drug. My experience in Wagbe here has been very great. I came here in 2014. Um, so after my 
undergraduate, I joined the lab in 2015 and I served as a research assistant. When I entered, I didn't know anything about research, but um, I've got opportunity through mentorship and training. I've had great experience here. Sure, I think there's fairness in the enrollment process. Um, for what I know, I was fortunate after my uh, master's, first year master's, I was enrolled into the PhD program. Then what I have seen so far, I realized mm -hmm. before you get admission to the program, you write in exams and they try to balance, look at gender balance and also the international and the local students. So there's fairness in the selection process. So my PhD thesis or project seeks to develop novel diagnosis for detecting plasmodium species. So plasmodium species are parasite that causes malaria. And currently we have um, RDTs and microscopy at the point of care for detecting the species. But unfortunately, these tools are not sensitive or specific enough for detecting the species. So there are more reliable tools, which are the PCR or molecular-based diagnostic tools. And if I can give you an example, that's what we are using to detect COVID now. But the unfortunate thing is these tools are not readily available in terms of the reagent. So my project seeks to develop this um, reagent here in Ghana so that we can make them readily available and also cost-effective for detecting infectious diseases. The center runs three programs at the master's level which includes Master of Philosophy in Molecular Cell Biology of Cell and Infectious Diseases, Master of Philosophy in Biochemistry, and Master of Philosophy in Molecular Biology. The PhD level includes PhD in Biochemistry and PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology of Infectious Diseases. The centre also engages the community in its activities from time to time. What was of common interest to all of us was that we wanted to create a world-class research and training environment to do basic science. Now, this was um, led by me, but with support from, you know, several colleagues here at the Department of Biochemistry and also at the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. In terms of the resources we need, we need sustainable funding, predictable funding. If you look at all the countries that have developed they have predictable funding for research and for science. If you look at the USA, they have something called the NIH, which they pump billions and billions of dollars in every year as part of their national budget. It's locked in. Ghana, we still don't have that. We've been talking about a research and innovation bill for a long time. Still not been enacted. We need to have such things so that we as scientists, there's a fund that we can apply to, to access funds, to do research and to innovate on a sustainable basis. As we, as we say, we compete for funds from overseas and that is not predictable nor sustainable because a lot of the funders, they keep asking us, how much is your government contributing? Okay, we've given you 8 million, we've given you 6 million, we've given you 5 million, how much is your government contributing? Everybody knows that Africa has problems. Our problems are all over the news. We get offended when people point out only the problem. But it's also very clear that the only people who will solve Africa's problems are Africans themselves. We are waiting for malaria vaccines to be developed in Europe and North America for us to use. We are waiting for people, you know, for Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter to come and eradicate Guinea worm in Ghana. If Africa and in Ghana is going to achieve what I, all, I believe and we all believe we can achieve. We have to take responsibility for our problems and come up with locally relevant solutions to solve those problems. For me, WACPIP represents a place that is trying to do its bit to contribute towards this. We are trying to train the next generation of scientists not to come and work at WACPIP. We are training the next generation of scientists to think of ways to solve problems they see in their own community. International students are helped um, through WACPEP to, um, to obtain accommodation. And basically what we do is that um, we liaise with the hostels and the halls on campus and um, arrange um, some of the rooms for them before they, they actually come, come in. At WACPEP, we provide at least um, two um, forms of scholarship. One, 
from the ACE um, World Bank um, grant and the other from the Delta's um, program. Because we are in the tropics, a lot of patients report to the hospitals with high temperature. This is usually attributed to malaria, but we found out that malaria answers, let's say, 40% of those cases. For the other 60%, they are presumably treated as malaria. And in most cases, the patients keep going back because it's not malaria. So what else is causing it? It's not clearly known. And the diagnostic systems in the hospitals are not advanced enough to take care of a variety of uh, disease conditions. So this uh, project was undertaken by one Nicholas, who looked at a whole panel of pathogens. So this was a discovery project. Okay, so once um, a child reports with fever and um, it's not attributed to anything else but the infection and they check for malaria and malaria is not there, they then take those samples and look for all manner of pathogens. Okay, and they were able to discover a whole variety of viruses and bacterial pathogens that explain those other febrile illness. So going forward, that would, you know, instruct a new way of uh, attending to patients in that category. So that um, we can, what we haven't done is to develop diagnostics that can be used in the, in the hospitals, but that is the next phase that we can look at. The second is um, diagnostic technologies that have been developed by uh, two PhD students, Francis Krampa and Felix Ansa. So the, here they are looking for electronic ways of detecting malaria. Okay, so what we have in the system right now is glucometer. You, you put a drop of blood and it tells you the level of glucose in your blood. We, we are trying to do the same for malaria so that people can even test at home, right, and not have to go to the hospital when this becomes um, available on the market. The third one is a project that concerns um, a new way of developing antibiotics. You know, And what we are trying to do is to target what we call the genome stability of pathogens. This has not been done before, and we are pioneering that from this center for the first time. And we're hoping that over the years, we will make progress that will lead to the next generation of antibiotics. The first uh, output that we had from our sequencing was a manuscript, which was published. And that was the first 46 sequences uh, of SARS-CoV-2 in Ghana. We published that last year. And since then, we've done almost a thousand sequences. So we are preparing that also to, um, to publish it. And why that is important is we are tracking basically the changes in the virus locally. Because this, um, if you look at literature or the news, you see how it's changing globally. But you have to know the local outbreak. You have to know the local epidemic. And what we see in Ghana is that sometimes the variants which are increasing are not necessarily what is increasing in the rest of the world. You know. For now, for instance, uh, we have Delta, which is also on the rise in Ghana. But there's another variant, which is nobody's talking about, but it's rising almost faster than Delta in Ghana. So that's the sort of things that we do. And when we get the results, we write um, what we call policy briefs, advising the government that this is what we found. Um, earlier on in this, this year, when we did our sequencing of airport samples, and we first uh, found the alpha variant, that's the UK variant. And then we found it in local circulation and we wrote it, um, we communicated to the government. And that was what led to the reinstatement of uh, some of the restrictions, like uh, restricting the funeral size, party size, and things like that. That was as a direct result of the work that we're doing. The key message that uh, we want to put out there is that Africa has a lot of talent. If you look across the world, there are African scientists 
doing great things all over the place. Some of these COVID vaccines that we are seeing, African scientists played key roles in developing them so quickly in different countries. If we create the right environment for them, a lot of these people will come back home. We have already brought seven scientists, African scientists who were in the diaspora, we brought them here. And the reason why they were able to come back or they were convinced to come back is because they came and looked around like you guys have looked around and they saw that they can do good science here and that this environment looks like where they've been working in the UK or in the US and they are convinced that this is world class enough. If we create that, we can start to bring all our talent back and Africa can start to develop our own vaccines, can develop our own drugs, we can be more innovative and build new technologies that we can even export to other parts of the world and not sit as we are now waiting for people to develop vaccines, use for their people when they have had enough, then they share with us. That's why we, that's where we are now. Okay. That situation has to change. That means we have to take matters into our own hands. That means the African governments have to start to put some money into science on a consistent basis. Let's have a fund such as we have uh, uh, National Health Insurance Fund, we have GET Fund, we have all these funds that a percentage of the taxes goes directly into that fund every year. So that fund is available for scientists to access. Let's do that. Let's put some money aside for science because this type of investment have to be done for us to develop. Otherwise, we keep marking time. We keep just treading water because if you keep relying on people for, for your innovations, that means you are not making progress, you know? I, I keep telling people that if you think about investment in science, think about it like the way we invested in petroleum exploration. You know, ever since I was a child, I was hearing about GMPC spending billions and billions of dollars doing oil exploration, okay? They didn't find oil until just maybe what, 10 years ago or less after spending billions and billions of dollars. Nobody complained that they were spending billions of dollars because they knew that when they found oil, they'll get a lot of money from it. It's the same with science. Don't think about what you get tomorrow. You know, Don't say that, oh, I've given you 200,000, so what have you brought after two weeks? And it doesn't work that way. It has to be consistent investment over time. And then when you succeed, it will pay for itself. If we made a vaccine right now, can you imagine if we had a COVID vaccine and we're supplying to the whole of Africa? Can you imagine how much money Ghana will be making? But if you don't invest, you won't get. You won't get there. So you have to invest, and then eventually you will hit the jackpot. If there is any biomedical research center that promotes innovation and in research or that provides its students with unmatched financial resources and an environment for learning and research, it is the West Africa Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, WACBIB, providing world-class postgraduate training and research into tropical diseases in sub-Saharan.